Welcome to Empowered Learning. This is the part four video in the video series for uh, the topic of power series. So in the part three video, we had started to talk about how we use power series to represent functions. Um, in, in particular, we saw how we started to use derivatives and integrals of functions to sort of manipulate the function that we needed to force to be in power series form uh, to be something that we could better work with so that we could use that form and then uh, either translate back by doing uh, differentiation or integration to uh, get back into the original form that we wanted, but it would be in power series form at that point. Now, um, we're going to do some more examples of that. And so this is uh, one of those that we're going to do. And then after we finish that, we're going to go ahead and move forward and show how we could use power series to evaluate a definite interval. Okay, so for this function, one divided by um, one plus x squared, uh, we do know that we could rewrite this as one over one plus x squared like this. And we could also rewrite this this way, okay? So, of course, now we're saying, yep, we realize that um, that 1 divided by 1 minus x, we could rewrite that as a power series, right? So if we did that, we would have summation of, well, actually, we can rewrite it as a geometric series and then force it to be a power series. So uh, we could rewrite it like this, where our a is going to be 1 and our r is going to be minus x. And it'll be raised to the n minus 1. And of course, that would be squared. Okay. Now, the good thing about what we have here is that um, we, we got f of x looking like something in polynomial form real easy. The problem here is that we have uh, essentially an infinite term polynomial that we would have to somehow list out and then take that infinite term polynomial and then multiply it times itself and figure out what all the terms are, okay? So although this looks like this is something that we would want to do, in the long run, this is something that is actually causing more problems um, than it is helping our situation here, okay? Uh, because of the fact that uh, we can't list out the infinite number of terms of a polynomial and then list them out again and then multiply uh, together, you know, uh, the square. So this approach that we've done here is, although it looks like it would have got us to our answer real easy, not something um, that we want to do here, okay? So the next thing that we think about is, is all right, can we either take the derivative of this function or take the antiderivative of this function and come up with something that uh, we could possibly work with? Okay. Well, we know that this particular function here can be rewritten as one plus x raised to the negative two. Now, if I take the derivative of this function, I'm going to have a negative two times one plus x raised to the negative three times um, here is just one so it'll just be this if i was to take the most general antiderivative of this particular function then um, in this sense i would end up having a negative one over one plus x of course plus some constant and um, of course we uh, know that we can get this by doing the substitution rule okay now, here, this is just going to end up looking like this if we write it in the form like what we have our function being in. This is worse than what we originally had. So we don't want this. However, we can work with that. That's a whole lot easier for us to work with. So our strategy is, is that we want to figure out what is the antiderivative of this function, which we already know it now. And then after we figure out what this looks like as a power series, 
we're going to take the derivative of that power series to get the actual function f of x. Okay, so that is going to be our strategy here. So I'm going to come here and say uh, because of this, we know that the most general antiderivative of this is just going to be some constant times a negative one over one plus x. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and get rid of all of this. And we're just going to work with this antiderivative here, get it in power series form, and then take the derivative of it. All right, so for right now, um, what we're going to work with is just this negative 1 over 1 plus x. Okay, and we're going to rewrite that as a negative 1 over 1 minus a negative x. And of course, this is going to look like um, a divided by 1 minus r, where our a is a negative 1, and r is going to be minus x. So therefore, negative 1 divided by 1 plus x is just going to be summation. And we're putting this in geometric series form now. This will be a negative one times negative x raised to the n minus one. And we change the index of the counter here to n equals zero so that we could have it in power series form. So this will be a minus one again, minus x raised to the n. And of course, here um, we could go a little further. Notice here we have this minus one, and we could break out the minus one that's inside of this minus x. So we'll have that minus one raised to the n times x raised to the n. And of course, here, this minus one um, is the same as minus one raised to the one. So we could rewrite uh, the minus one raised to the one times minus one raised to the n as just minus one raised to the n plus one. So we're going to go ahead and do that now. So that minus one raised to the n plus one. All right, and so this is what the derivative, sorry, not the derivative, but the antiderivative of our function that we really want to know of, this is what it's going to look like in power series form, okay? So therefore, we know that the antiderivative of this is just going to be C plus what we have here. I'm just going to rewrite all that. Okay, and so therefore, um, this implies that if we take the derivative of the antiderivative, then that is like taking the derivative of what we have going on here. And of course, uh, with the power series, the only thing that we really have to worry about is the x raised to the n part. Um, since we're taking the derivative, we know that we're going to lose a term. So of course, the derivative of a constant is going to be zero, so we're gonna lose that. And of course, when we take the derivative of this power series, we're going to lose uh, the first term of it as well. So um, in doing that, we know that what we're gonna end up with is the summation, and I'll go ahead and put in the index later. But this is going to stay the same. So this will be n uh, times x raised to the n minus 1. And this will be n equals 1 goes to infinity. Okay. 
And again, to get that in our power series form, we want to change the index from n equals 1 to n equals 0. So to do that, we know that this n minus 1 here is just going to change the n. So what this also means here is that this n plus 1 is now going to change to n plus 2. Okay, and I'll write it and then we'll explain. Okay. I'm going to try to write this again. So this in here, since uh, we're going back one, this would have to go. This would have to go up one. And here, this x raised to the n minus one. Of course, that'll just be x raised to the n. Okay. So uh, to make sure that we have this straight here. Notice that if n is equal to 1 here, and we have a 1 there, 1 there, 1 there. So we see that this negative 1 would have a power of 2. This n here would be 1. And this x raised to the n minus 1, this n minus 1 here would be 0. So we have to replicate that whenever we change our index. So um, here we basically need two here. And of course, if we plug in a zero there, we get that. Um, here we need a one. So if I plug in zero right here, I still have one. And here in this exponent for the first time, I need a zero. So of course, if I plug in a zero there, I get that. So I know that what I have here index wise is going to match up with what I had when it's in its uh, geometric series form. Okay. All right, so I'm going to erase all of that and then uh, we'll go ahead and move on and finish up this example here. All right, so at this point, um, what we know here is that the original function that we were dealing with, so f of x, which is 1 divided by 1 plus x quantity squared. We know that we could express as derivative of the antiderivative of the function. And of course, uh, we found out that this could be expressed in this power series form. And here, this negative 1 raised to the n plus 2. Um, note that this could be just negative 1 raised to the n times negative 1 raised to the 2. And of course, this part is just 1. So I could just replace that with just negative 1 raised to the n times the n plus 1 times x raised to the n. And so that would be uh, the power series representation for it. And so now we need to figure out what is going to be the uh, radius and interval of convergence here. So if we go back to what we saw, we know that our um, common ratio here was minus x. So that means that minus x, the absolute value of that is going to have to be less than one um, in order for the infinite series that are part of this power series to converge. Okay. So here for the IOC, we know that this is going to have to be less than one, which essentially just means that X is going to have to, absolute value of X is going to have to be less than one, which again is just another way of saying X has to be strictly in between negative one and one. And so this will be our IOC. Um, and of course, our ROC would just be half the distance of what the IOC is, and that's going to be one as well. Okay, so for our next example here, um, we're asked to find out what is x squared divided by one plus x quantity cubed going to look like 
um, as a power series. And of course, we also want to find the radius of convergence and interval of convergence as well. So um, as we stated before, um, we have this x squared here in the numerator, and we know that we're going to try to initially, if we can, force this to look like a uh, power series. So we know that we can kind of just leave that out in front. And if we could force the rest of this to look like a power series, uh, we can just multiply it back in once we're done. Okay. Now, if we look at this one divided by one plus X quantity cubed, um, we know based off of the previous example that we had, where we had one divided by one plus X quantity squared, we know that we're not going to be able to rewrite that as um, in, in a geometric series form sum immediately. Okay. So we're going to have to take advantage of what we know as far as um, our derivatives and antiderivatives to be able to help us out here. Okay. Now, note that in our last problem, we noticed here, uh, as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll write it here because um, yeah, let me write this so I can set this up right. So last time in, in the last example, we had we had this. And of course, one of the things that we realized that if we took the antiderivative of this, then this is equal to a negative um, one divided by one plus X, of course, plus an integration constant. And we found out how to express this one divided by one plus X quantity squared in power series form, okay? Now, we also said that if we took the derivative of this particular function here, okay, we also found out that we had a negative two over one plus X quantity cubed, okay? So the good thing about what we're seeing here is that we already know how to express this in power series form, okay? Uh, forgetting about the integral sign. We already know how to express that integrand in power series form. And we also know that the derivative of this is that. And of course, <clears throat> here, we don't really want to mess with the one divided by one plus X quantity cubed because we have this already in power series form. We could just take the derivative of that to get this um, negative two over one plus X quantity cubed here, and then just kind of massage what we need to here so that uh, we just end up with a one. Okay. So here we could take this and say, all right, we have that, and then basically multiply this times um, a negative one half to get this one up here that we need, and we'll have what we need for that portion of it, okay? And then of course, once we're done expressing that, we can use the x squared, multiply it in, and finish everything out, okay? So <clears throat> I'm saying all that to say here, uh, because that's what this note here is starting to talk about. So I'm going to erase this and then uh, we'll go ahead and go through uh, this process here. So you see where it says, no, we know that the derivative of one divided by one plus X quantity cubed is just going to be um, essentially negative two divided by one plus X quantity cubed, okay? So make sure I said that right. So um, the derivative of one over one plus X quantity squared is just going to be negative two divided by one plus X quantity cubed, okay? So now that we know that, of course, the negative two portion, we really don't want. So we can just come up with a factor of one half to multiply what this derivative uh, would end up being to get what we want there, okay? And so again, um, we know from example C, we found that this function, the one 
divided by one plus x quantity squared could be expressed as this power series, okay? And of course, uh, we have the radius and interval of convergence with it. So all we have to do is take the derivative of this power series here. Once we're done with that, then multiply it times uh, the negative one half. And then once we're done with that, <laughs> we'll have everything and then include this x squared and we'll have the power series form of this actual function x squared divided by one plus x quantity cubed. So that is what we're going to do here. So we're going to switch colors. So we take the derivative of um, our function, which uh, f of x here from example c. So we're going to basically take the derivative of what we have here. Okay. And um, when we take the derivative of it, of course, we're going to lose a term because uh, the constant term is going to go away. Hence why we have the index being um, n equals one. The only thing that we really worry about is taking the derivative of this portion, which is just n times x raised to the n minus one. And that is what you see here. And then of course, from that, um, we need to change our index from n equals one back to n equals zero, okay? So to do that, um, we know that we're gonna need um, a one here. So if we change this to zero, that's gotta be n plus one to get that same one there. Um, we know we have to have a two here. So if we change this to zero, we gotta have n plus two here to make that happen. We have uh, n here, which is gonna be one. So this would have to be n plus one in order to still get that one there. And of course, um, here, if this was a one right there. One minus one is zero. So if we change this to zero, we gotta have the zero there, okay? So we see that everything uh, matches up. So we'll get rid of all this business here. And so now we have the derivative of our function one divided by one plus x quantity squared in the form that we need it in. And note that when we take the derivative of this, it's actually that, okay? So again, we see that negative one half of the derivative of this um, is what this is in power series form, which is essentially just a one over one plus x quantity cubed. And so now to get the actual function that we wanted, uh, because this is the x squared divided by one plus x quantity cubed part, we know that we could rewrite it like this. And of course, um, this portion is represented as a power series. And we just multiply that times x squared. And then we're just going to multiply that x squared times the x raised to the n. And what that's just going to end up being is just x raised to the n plus two um, per our exponential rules, okay? And so we see that uh, this particular function here, this one, can be expressed as this power series. And of course, the radius and interval of convergence is gonna be the same as it was for the previous problem because uh, we kind of use that to do this one. So for our last example, what we are going to do is to uh, use a power series to be able to approximate the definite integral of uh, the, the definite integral that we have below here to six decimal places. And so we see here that our integrand is x times arctan of 3x. And if you were to try to evaluate this particular definite integral by hand, um, you'll find out that it's difficult to near impossible to be able to do that using the techniques that we learn in first year and second year calculus, um, except for if you were, um, for instance, using uh, some kind of numerical integration like, um, you know, Simpson's rule or um, doing Raymond sums, uh, that, that sort of thing. OK, um, other than that, um, we would probably have to use a power series to be able to essentially take our integrand 
express it as an approximating polynomial and then take the antiderivative of that polynomial and you know evaluate it over the limits of integration to be able to figure it out and so um, in essence that is what we will be doing here so we are going to solve this problem by using the following uh, four steps and so i have three here but it really should say four because uh, i kind of split up one of the steps here um, when i wrote this out so step one will be find the power series equivalent of tangent inverse of 3x um, using equation two from the power series dif uh, differentiation integration theorem and, and i presented this um, earlier in the video series and so this particular equation is just what I'm underlying here. And all I'm saying is that if our function here can be written as a power series, then if we take the antiderivative of this, it's the same as taking the antiderivative of each term of this polynomial that's going to, um, in this case, approximate it. And everything is pretty much going to stay the same for each term except for where i have x minus a raised to the n and of course n will depend upon you know what term we're in um, here if we take the antiderivative of that it's just going to be what you see here x minus a raised to the n plus one divided by the same and uh, the part of the reason for this is that n doing the antiderivative for this uh, we can use the substitution rule um, if we let u equal x minus a here then uh, that's going to essentially end up saying that du ends up equaling dx okay because derivative of x is just one derivative of a is just going to be a constant and of course, we just have dx at the end there. So uh, because of all of that, it really doesn't change a whole lot. And we can just say x minus a raised to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. And everything else uh, will pretty much remain the same. Now, we also see here that in employing this particular equation, that our value of c here is just going to be the uh, value of the antiderivative evaluated at, um, in this case, x equals zero. Okay, so that's another thing that we found out from um, doing the power series. So step two, uh, once we figure out what tangent inverse or arctan of 3x is, we're going to multiply that power series result times x. And, um, and once we do that, what we're actually going to have is x times um, arctan of 3x, which is what we need for our integrand here to be able to essentially figure out what the antiderivative of it is. And of course, um, we will have this in at the end of step two, but it will be in power series form. So step three involves taking this result that is going to be in power series form and taking the antiderivative of that. So in other words, uh, we'll be essentially using equation two again to do that. So we'll take whatever this result is in power series form, take the antiderivative of it. And then step four, um, since we have to approximate our answer to six decimal places, we can either use the integral test or the alternating series estimation theorem to find an approximation uh, to the given definite integral to six decimal places. And so I say either the integral test or alternating series estimation theorem, uh, because in the event that we have a power series that does not have any negative terms, um, and of course, uh, what we end up having is a polynomial, uh, we should be able to figure out the behavior of the amount of the area under the curve by essentially integrating the continuous time equivalent of the power series. And that's what the integral test is for um, in this instance. If we end up having a power series 
that is that, that can be classified as an alternating series, meaning that it has um, every other term um, being negative, then we can use the alternating series estimation theorem uh, to find an approximation. And basically what that particular theorem uh, says is that um, if we were to approximate our function by using a power series and whatnot, uh, we'll be off no more than the B plus one ith term, okay? And what that means is, is if we use the first n terms to approximate um, whatever our answer is, then the error will be no more than what the value of the term that comes directly after it would be. And of course, that would be the um, absolute value of that. But we're stripping out all the, the negatives there. And so, um, again, this will be more clear as we go through the example. here. All right. So let's start with working on this to get to um, an answer here. So step one. The first thing that we see here is that we know for tangent inverse of 3x at this point, there's not much we can do to that to um, make this look like something that we can work with. But we do know that the derivative of tangent inverse in general here. So if I was to take the derivative of this in general, I know that this is just going to be 1 over 1 plus x squared. Okay, and we know that in terms of power series, we could write this this way such that it has this profile here. Okay, and we know that this is the profile of a geometric series. And we know that we have been leveraging what we know about geometric series to try to force the geometric series to be written as a power series, which in this case um, would take whatever we get for the a times r raised to the n minus one and just change the counter from n equals one to n equals zero. Okay, so because we know that we can work with the result of the derivative of tangent inverse and essentially rewrite it as a geometric series, um, we could also work with the derivative of tangent inverse of 3x and rewrite that as a geometric series. So that's what we're going to do. So we see if we take the derivative of tangent inverse of 3x, this is what it ends up looking like uh, whenever we use chain rule. Of course, do some simplification here and we write it this way so that we can prompt ourselves to have it in this form to where we could write it as the sum of a geometric series here. And of course, once we do that, we see A goes with three and R goes with this negative nine X squared, okay? So that's why we have that here. So uh, we know that the derivative of tangent inverse of three X can be written as a geometric series. So uh, these next few steps here, we just do that. So uh, we know that this can be written as um, the sum of a geometric series. And then geometric series, if we let a equal 3 and r equal negative 9x squared, we'll just end up looking like this at the end of the day. Okay. Um, and of course, the step that I did from here to here is basically change something that looks like um, a normal geometric series uh, to one that will kind of follow the profile of a power series here. And then I just filled in what A and R was in this step. Okay, so from that, um, my job now is to rewrite what I have inside of here so that I can essentially take the antiderivative of what I have left, okay? So what I do here is I break things out, and of course I see that the negative that's right here is letting me know that I have an alternating uh, factor here that's gonna change sign every other term. Another thing that I see here is that I have um, nine x squared all raised to the power of n. 
and I know that nine can be written as three squared. So I've separated um, nine raised to the n and x squared raised to the n, and I've chosen to write nine as three squared. And part of the reason for that is because I have this three right here and I want it all to come together. So if I have three here and three uh, raised to the two n essentially, because I know that from exponential rules, I can rewrite three squared, all that raised to the n is just three raised to the two n. Then I have three raised to the two n plus one from all these threes here. Of course, my alternating um, series factor goes here, and then x squared raised to the n is just x raised to the 2n. And so it's important for me to get this particular power series written like this because I know that this portion of the power series is just going to be a constant. So that part is not going to be important to me um, when it comes to trying to take the antiderivative of this to essentially get back uh, the tangent inverse of 3x. This portion is not a constant, and this is the part that I'm actually going to take the antiderivative of. Okay. So here we see that what we initially started to work off with was the derivative of tangent inverse of 3x can essentially just be written this way in its power series form. And again, whenever we take the antiderivative, it's just this x raised to the 2n that I'm actually going to take the antiderivative of it. Everything else is going to pretty much stay the same. So here I note that if 3 divided by 1 plus 9x squared is going to be the derivative of tangent inverse. So this is what all of this stuff is. Then if I take the most general antiderivative of it, or integral of it, which is I'm basically undoing the derivative, then the result that I should get should just be tangent inverse itself. Okay, so. Essentially, what I'm going to do is represent this 3 divided by um, 1 plus 9x squared as a power series, and that's what you're seeing here. And then in this next step, as I told you before, everything that's constant remains the same, but because this x raised to the 2n has a variable in it, and of course I'm um, integrating with respect to x, this is the result of me taking the antiderivative of x raised to the 2 n. Okay. Now, of course, I add the plus c on the n because I am um, taking the most general antiderivative, meaning I have an integral sign with no limits of integration, so I have to have an integration constant. Okay. So from all that, um, I realize again that when I do the integral of the derivative of tangent inverse of 3x, it's just going to be tangent inverse of 3x. So in general, tangent inverse of 3x is just going to be this particular power series. Here. And I've just rewritten it at this point. Here, we're almost done with step one. All we need to do is figure out what is going to be our integration constant. Okay, Do we have enough information for that? Well, if you recall, we know that our integration constant, according to how we write this as a power series, is just the antiderivative evaluated at zero. And so here, if we let um, little f, f of x equal the derivative of big f of x, where little f of x is essentially the derivative of tangent inverse of 3x, then we know that the antiderivative of the derivative of tangent inverse of 3x is just tangent inverse of 3x. Okay, So here, um, all that's to say that the, the antiderivative of what we're dealing with here is tangent inverse. So all we have to do, uh, tangent inverse of 3x, so all we have to do is evaluate that at zero. And of course, we get zero for that. Life is simple at this point. And tangent inverse of 3x 
can be represented as this particular power series. So summation n equals zero to infinity um, of negative one raised to the n times three raised to the two n plus one times x raised to the two n plus one divided by two n plus one. And so this is the end of our step one. So let's move on to step two now. So step two is relatively simple. Um, all we need to do here is to take our power series version of tangent inverse and just multiply it times x. Of course, all of this is what the tangent, uh, what the power series version of tangent inverse of 3x is. So if we multiply it times x, then we're just taking this x, multiplying it times the power series. And note that since the summation or a sigma notation operator, its variable is in terms of n, it regards x as a constant. So what that essentially means is that x could just creep on in here like this and be multiplied times this x raised to the 2n plus 1, okay? And if we do that, if we take x raised to the 2n plus 1 and multiply it by x, which is the same as x raised to the 1, we know that by our exponential rules, that's just going to be x raised to the 2n plus 2. And that is what you see here. Everything else is the same. So now we have a way of expressing x times tangent inverse of 3x in terms of a power series. And so this is the end of our step two. And we see here that um, at this point, we have our integrand for what it is that we are trying to evaluate the definite integral for in a polynomial form, okay? Um, of course, it's a power series, but uh, the power series is just essentially a compact way of expressing um, in a polynomial with an infinite number of terms. All right, so let's move on to step three. So step three says now that we have our integrand expressed essentially as a polynomial, uh, I can take the antiderivative of that particular polynomial and evaluate it um, how I normally would in a regular first year calculus course, okay, by using the net change theorem. So we see here that our definite integral of x times arctan of 3x dx from 0 to 0.1 we just replace our integrand with a power series equivalent for it. And then after that, notice again that if we're going to be taking the antiderivative of the power series with respect to x, then all things in terms of n here are constants. So uh, this negative 1 raised to the n, 3 raised to the 2n plus 1, and this 2n plus 1 are all constants. So all we have to worry about here is taking the antiderivative of x raised to the 2n plus 2. Okay. And of course, if we do that, well, we just add 1 to the exponent and divide by the same. And this would be the result of that. And everything else that you see here is the constants that we carry over uh, because, again, the sigma notation here is in terms of n and not x, okay? So we've taken the antiderivative of this polynomial equivalent of x times tangent inverse of 3x, and we need to evaluate that from 0 to um, 0.1, or 1 tenth. So at this point, um, notice what I've done here is I start listing out the terms of the polynomial by plugging in various values of n here. So I'm going to erase what I have to sort of demonstrate that for one or two steps so you can kind of follow what's going on and then uh, we'll move on. All right, so let's say here, I'm going to switch colors here for a moment. So let's say here I want to plug in 0 for n. So if I plug in 0 here, 0 here, 0 here, 
zero here and zero here. Of course, negative one raised to the zero is one. Two times zero is zero. And zero plus one is one. So three raised to the one is just three. Same deal here, zero times two is zero. Zero plus three is three. And what we have is x cubed. Two times zero is zero. Zero plus three is three. And then of course here, two times zero is zero, plus one, just have one. So we have th three times x cubed over one times three. And that is what you see here. And so that's what happens whenever we allow n to equal zero. If we were to repeat this process and let n equal one, then we would end up getting what you see here, okay? And of course, um, in looking at this, if we let n equals one here, then negative one raised to the one is just a negative one, hence why that particular term is negative. And again, if we kept on, if n is two, this is what we would get. If n is three, this is what we would get, okay? And so at this point, uh, this is uh, the end of step three. So we have actually taken the antiderivative of the power series equivalent of what our integrand is. And so now all we have to do is evaluate this particular uh, antiderivative um, over our limits of integration here. But we want to do it in a way to where um, we get the approximation that we want uh, within six decimal places, okay? And so here's where we will use the alternating series estimation theorem to be able to figure out how many of these terms of our polynomial that we're using to approximate um, this, uh, this integrand here and thus the antiderivative of it uh, so that we'll know all right, how many of these to write? And then we, from there, we can tangibly evaluate the definite integral. So as I mentioned before, step four, uh, we know that uh, since we have the antiderivative of x times arctan of 3x, we're just going to use the ultimate alternating series estimation theorem to approximate this integral to seven decimal places, which is another way of saying that we want to be within one times 10 to the negative seven of what the actual answer is. So to do that, to put it in the language of uh, the alternating series estimation theorem, um, we desire some error, and we're gonna call it R sub n, to be the difference in between the actual sum of the power series, in this case, uh, the actual answer for our definite integral, and here, um, what the first n terms of our answer would be. So um, kind of going back up here to make my point, um, s of n would be, if we use the first n terms here and evaluated this particular um, answer here by using our limits of integration, this is what s sub n would be. Whereas s, would be if we listed out all of the infinite number of terms here and then tried to evaluate using the limits of integration. So that's the difference. So we know that the difference in between what it actually is minus what our estimate is going to be um, has to be within six decimal places. And another way of saying that is that um, the absolute value of the error has to be less than uh, one times 10 to the negative seven, okay? And just so that you know, that's like um, decimal number with six zeros behind it and then a one, okay? So we wanna be lower than this amount of error to get to our answer. Now, the alternating series estimation theorem states that if we have an alternating series, then the absolute value of the error um, for the first n terms of whatever it is that we're trying to estimate 
the error can be no more than the value of the b sub n plus one th term. Okay. And so what this b sub n plus one of term is, we'll go back up here, it is essentially the non negative version of what we see here. Okay. Or you can say it's the absolute value of what this particular uh, sequence is for our power series. So make life simple. We strip out this part because that's the part that makes, you know, half the terms essentially negative. And we just concentrate on what we have here um, because we know all four of these factors here are going to produce positive numbers. Okay. Um, based upon our limits of integration. So looking at that, that is why I'm saying here that our B sub N is just going to be absolute value of what the, the sequence was that made up the power series, which is what you're seeing here. Notice that the negative one raised to the N is stripped out and all we have left is everything else evaluated from um, zero to point one. Okay. So now at this point, we're going to start to calculate each term of B sub N uh, starting with N equals zero until we get a number that's going to be less than uh, point, sorry, less than one times 10 to the negative seven. Okay. Now, when we start to do this, if we know what B sub N is, then here, if I let N, N equals zero, then I know that here that my error has to be less than or equal to B sub N plus one. And if N is zero, then um, it would have to be um, no more than B one. Okay. If we were going to approximate um, our answer here, just using one term of our polynomial. Of course, um, when we plug in, all the information here. So essentially, if we let n equal zero, um, in this particular case here, uh, this means that we're looking at the b sub one term. So what we would be doing here is looking at this, like this is b sub one and plugging in one everywhere where we see n to get our value here. And if we do that, we see that we end up getting 27 uh, divided by 15 times X raised to the five, evaluate that from zero to point 0.1. Now, to make this simple, we've already done this work because if we go back here, notice that what you see right here is the term B sub one. And notice that um, we left the negative part out. So what this means for us here is this is the B sub zero term. And what we see here is the B sub two term. And what we see here is the B sub three term, okay? So I'm stating that uh, to say that we don't have to recreate the wheel. Uh, we kind of see where this is going. So when I was writing this out here, I noticed that um, I already knew what my B sub one, B sub two, and B sub three term um, actually was. All I need to do now is just evaluate it um, across my limits of integration to see what numbers I get. And you see that once I get to when N is equal to two, which is going to be the uh, B sub three term, then I actually get a number that is smaller than uh, one times 10 to the negative seven, okay? because this is kind of what I'm looking for here. And of course, three times, sorry, 3.471 times 10 to the negative eight is smaller than one times 10 uh, to the negative seven. And of course, both of these other terms was bigger than this number here. So I had to keep on going. So what this tells us is that we're going to stop here when N is equal to two, which means uh, we're just going to use the first three terms of our power series. That is, we're going to use the term when n is equal to one, n is equal to two, n is equal to three. Okay. And what that looks like here, if we go back to what we were talking about first here, we are going to be using the first 
three terms to estimate our answer for this definite interval. All right, so let's go ahead and complete step four now, now that we know where to stop. So at this point, um, we're just gonna go ahead and move on. And we'll say here that we're going to have our definite integral. It could be expressed as evaluating the power series of the equivalent of what this is from zero to point one. And of course, um, it listed this way means that we have an infinite number of terms, but we're going to approximate it by just looking at the first three. And so then of course, from there, um, we do what we normally do in a first year calculus course with this. Uh, we evaluate the antiderivative equivalent in this case, or, approx or approximation in this case, um, using x is equal to 0.1. So using the upper limit minus doing the same thing to the lower limit. And of course, at this point, um, you just do your number crunching, you know, however you want to do it. And I decided to, I wanted to put it in fraction form before getting to the final answer, but this is uh, what it would be in fraction form. And if we were to uh, put that in the calculator and estimate, then we see that this would be 9.826942857 times 10 raised to negative four. And so that would be the value of the definite integral that we're asked to work with. Uh, within one times 10 to the negative seven amount of error. Okay. So the final thing that we're going to do here is sort of do a sanity check. Um, and I went ahead and I graphed this in Desmos and I have a picture of what I actually came up with here. So I'm going to scroll down and show it to you. So uh, the blue curve that you see here is just um, a portion of what X times arc 10 of three X's. And of course, we're trying to measure the area under the curve, all that's shaded here. And uh, we're doing it from X equals zero to X equals 0 0.1. Of course, we label that A and B as such. If we let Desmos calculate the area under the curve, you see how it's the point zero, 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 um, you know, nine, eight, two, six, six, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Now, also notice that big F of X here is going to be the antiderivative of X times arc 10 of three X or the approximation for it, I should say. And if we evaluate this polynomial here, um, that's approximating the antiderivative of X times arc 10 of three X, um, the way that we just got through doing at the upper limit minus the lower limit, uh, we see here that our answer is very close to what the actual answer is um, as far as what Desmos can calculate. Okay? And of course, the error that we received here, which is um, the actual sum minus the um, sum of the first three terms, uh, which I'm looking at it this way as just the antiderivative evaluated at 0.1 minus zero, we see that we have this particular number here, and this number um, is essentially less than one times 10 to the negative seven. So we know what we have here is, is, is coming out the way that it's supposed to, okay? And so with this, uh, this concludes the video series on um, using power series. Um, in this case, uh, we've used power series to represent functions um, in their infinite infinite term polynomial equivalent forms. And we've also seen how we can take the derivatives and integrals um, of certain functions to represent them in power series form to be able to do things like what we've just seen here, which is estimate area under the curve. When we have a situation where the antiderivative of the function that we have to deal with does not have a an, an elementary function um, representation for it. So we have to represent it as a polynomial and get the equivalent of it to make those things happen for us. I hope this video um, has helped. Take care.